My name is Tawny Anderson and I'm a therapist in private practice. I help people um, improve the quality of their lives. I work with women and I work with men too. Mostly the men that I work with are in really dire situations because it takes a lot for most men to ask for help. I think it's because they're the strong ones. They're the, the knight in shining armor. They're the ones who are supposed to protect us. So if if they're supposed to protect us, then why they can't ask for help? Because what would that mean then? So it's hard for them to say, I need help. My lived experience with suicide was a culmination of events and years. It was just this one day when it was just too much. And I realized that I can't go on anymore and the world would be better without me. That kind of pain that once that want, you want to die, you can't even articulate it. So it's not like you can just say somebody to somebody like, oh, I want to die. You know, it's just this, this despondence that just settles in and then you just start giving up. It was devastating to be 42 years old and think this is my life. I'm smart. I went to the Naval Academy. I'm educated. I've been all over the world and I can't come up with a $500 rent. It's like crazy. people are going to die. You can't feel that other people love you. You can't. I know I'm surrounded by love, so, but the, you don't feel it. I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't even sip water. Do you know what I mean? There's this dark emptiness inside of you. The only light was that I was gonna die. light was that I had I had something that I could control something that could end all the pain and the suffering and the shame and the embarrassment so that's 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 what gave me that push to go out and get some roses and some and chicken salad and make a ritualistic of getting ready to die so I walked in the coffee shop and to the left was a blur of blue it's just blue. And I remember the blue walking totally close into me. And it walked into my eyesight like this. And it was a man. It was, it was a police officer. And he reached his hand out and he shook my hand. And when I was telling you, he shook my hand, my whole body just became light, you know? And my vision kind of kind of went like this. You know, like I could see just a little bit more. That, and I felt like, oh my God, somebody sees me. Somebody sees that I'm not okay, I'm not okay. Silently, all these years through this terrible time, I had been praying to God, asking God for help. I had been, you know, telling God my dreams about going around the world and helping people create schools and build schools and missions and things like this. And then he's telling me about his church the police officers tell me about his church and how they go around the world and they build schools and houses and all of a sudden has touched me like it wasn't over. Like I still had things to do. I went on a mission trip down to the Dominican Republic and we built two classrooms. So happy. <laughs> I am so happy that that wouldn't have that would not have happened if I was dead, you know. <laughs> when you're kind to someone else, you don't know whose life you just may save. That's where people come in. That's where my practice comes in. Like, you know what? You can make it through this. You can do this. So say hello to that person in the elevator. You know, look them in the eyes and be kind when you're walking down the street. Kindness is very powerful. And they may not even say anything to you, but they go home and they go, oh, I'm not alone. <laughs>